The Righteous is incredibly rich in themes of love, betrayal, and political intrigue spanning over decades. So what inspired you to really explore those themes and that particular time period? Oftentimes I find that when I'm worried about uh, circumstances in the present, I turn to history to try and say, okay, how did this begin? Or how has this been dealt with in the past? Um, and so I think turning to the 1980s was a way of saying there's so many forces of division um, in, our, in our civil discourse, so much mistrust that has been amplified over the last several years um, between neighbors, between people who you know, have much in common. And in some ways, those conflicts begin to um, claim vocabularies that we, we still use or that we might recognize in the 80s. And, and so it felt like a really fruitful starting point, um, both in terms of the distance from the present discomfort or questioning that might allow for a little bit more perspective, a little bit more um, insight than, than what's in our laps at the moment in a way that fosters a kind of hope, perhaps. So how did you incorporate the cultural and historical context of the late 70s and 80s American Southwest into the narrative? Um, and what significance does that hold for the character's experience? Mm -hmm. Really, the meat of the 80s for me um, feels like questions of um, oil, natural resources, fossil fuels as a driver of the American economy and a sense of prosperity that Americans were claiming and, and really getting behind even while understanding that it was fraught, you know, uh, geopolitical d dynamics had great bearing upon, you know, gas prices and gas availability at that time. Um, we move into the beginning of the um, vocabulary of women's liberation, women thinking about the role that they've been made to play in institutions like the church or the family, and, um, beginning to recognize that there is an opportunity to push back against that that might get traction in ways that are different from, from history. And of course, the AIDS crisis is a huge part of, of um, that legacy. And one of our characters, Jonathan, is um, closeted for most of the people in his life. But he's beginning to recognize the desire to go out and live in the world as a gay man amidst this crisis where um, to claim that identity is also to step into a kind of peril. It's also a moment where we see organized religion moving into the political sphere and having great um, influence. And these are all things that feel like we are, we're still grappling with the implications of that um, and the machinations of that. So it feels like there's probably um, more that we have in common with the 80s uh, for better and worse than, um, than with other decades that we might have turned to. So, Greg, how will the production depict what's happening around these characters? So we're collaborating with a wonderful director, Kevin Newberry, who we actually worked together with, Tracy and I, on our first opera, Caster and Patience. And so what's great about that is the three of us have a shared vocabulary um, for you know, building a world on stage. And, um, and one of the things that Kevin really likes and that Tracy and I really like are, are creating multiple scenes. So sometimes something will be happening on the left side of the uh, stage and it's a totally different scene on the right. So there's this kind of counterpoint with these different storylines rather than just going linearly through the piece. You know, religion and the divine and, 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 and faith play a huge role in the, in the world. And um, so Kevin has thought a lot about how to depict that on stage. Lighting is very important. Um, uh, the landscape around the theater is very important to try to somehow visually depict the, um, the kind of inner uh, sort of religious life of these characters on stage, both uh, in, a, in a private setting as well as in larger um, group settings. So I think the, all the sort of theatrical um, techniques Kevin's really thought about how to, again, create a sort of counterpoint that then um, builds upon the counterpoint between music and words that Tracy and I have been building. So Tracy, how did you ensure that sensitive topics like abuse, betrayal, and political ambition were handled with depth and sensitivity, especially considering the impact they had on the characters? Mm -hmm. 
there's the really powerful effect of the aria as a device or a mode, which allows the interior space of a character to fill the theater. There's this miraculous effect whereby, as an audience member, you feel like you're alone with that character as well. Um, and I think that dynamic creates a really um, powerful site of attention. Um, I think it also opens up a space within an ideal viewer where part of your own life that might rhyme in a way with what the, the characters are expressing or experiencing gets awakened or called to attention. Um, and it's not a mode we live in. You know, we live in a space um, where we're encouraged to debate, to stand our ground, to argue and dismiss. And so if, a, if an artistic mode can open up this other kind of um, respectful um, submission to another person's story, I feel like it's, it's not just good for like, uh, the dramatic experience of, of, of being in a theater and listening to an opera, but it's also really nourishing something that I think we need in our civic life. So I'm really excited about the, the, the ground we'll, we'll kind of tread into together. So Greg, can you talk to us about your writing style and the vehicle you used to write the arias in this opera? Sure, so central to the piece is the aria where you have one person speaking, could be five to seven minutes. Maybe they're telling a story, maybe it's a prayer, um, where you really have this kind of paradoxical world of the private and the public meeting. You're in a very public place. You have your thousands of people watching one person on stage, inviting you into their world. And I'm really interested in trying to use that in this piece because so much of this is about these internal spiritual journeys. And so bringing those two things together, which are very contradictory in some ways, but trying to fit them together hopefully creates a kind of um, uh, activated musical world where a lot of different types and modes of expression are possible in order to tell this story that passes between these moments of introspection and dialogue with forces greater than us. So to be able to go back and forth like that I think is something that I think opera does really well and that is a really a big part of what I try to do as a composer. So. Can you talk about David's growth and why you chose to give him a psalm-like aria to end the show? So uh, we start with a chorus and then uh, David sings a, a, a prayer that is, a, we think of them as a psalm. And then so we hear sort of David's internal monologue early in a psalm and then we get that again at the end. And so they're very different. The first one is very much a sort of contemplative prayer to God. and. Um, he says, God, my first love. Um, and there's something very uh, youthful about this first aria, um, hopeful. Um, and then David goes on this journey where, where he begins to act in the world and things get complicated and, and his romantic life becomes complicated. And, um, and so we return at the end to another prayer. And it's a, it's a very different prayer in a way. It's, it's a prayer of of humility, um, embracing a certain kind of uncertainty. He's at a kind of crossroads in his, in his life. And so I think we, in a way, because of the symmetry of the piece, we can kind of measure how far we've come with all the characters. So, um, so yeah, I like returning to the Villanelle form at the end to kind of check in with him and, uh, and, and, and see what a journey he's been on. There's something about the psalm or, you know, the, the forms of prayer um, you mentioned that it's hopeful in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I also feel like there's something about the mode of prayer that is always innocent, mm -hmm. no matter from what circumstances that desire to talk to God or make a plea emerges, it's coming from a place that no matter what else you've done, still retains the hope of possibility mm -hmm. of, um, you know, maybe it's forgiveness or maybe it's just the willingness to kind of stand bare in yourself. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's really exciting to see these characters come back to a place like that after the complexities, as you said, of their lives and their choices. I love that. There's a kind of innocence. There's a kind of earnestness about it. It's, it's very much, a, it feels like a gift 
to be able to watch that. Mm -hmm. And I think that transcends into what singers do in general. There's something very inherently generous about crying out you know, with poetry and music out to an audience. And what do you hope audiences will take away from experiencing the righteous? I love the practice of dwelling in uncertainty, irresolution, that is a part of this work because it is a part of this world <laughs> that we will return to. And um, the desire for clear cut answers, clear definitions of what another person is and what they probably want or want from you. Um, I think those things feel appealing at times because they're easy and they seek to keep things in their place. But um, I don't know, the further we get into the 21st century, it feels like that is a mythology that has run its course. And so the ability to say, okay, we're in the, the storm of it all and there's a part of us that must become comfortable there. Not to stand still and do nothing, but to imagine what it might mean to move forward into something that feels stable because everyone is cared for. I, I always feel when I write an opera, I want people to come out and love opera and say, oh wow, this is a powerful medium and it's, it's different than theater. It's different than watching a film. Um, there's something so, there's something very real about opera. Um, it's these voices without amplification, again, crying out to you. <laughs> I would say, I, I, I really hope that people say, oh yeah, that, that was an experience that I'll remember. And, um, and opera has something really, really spectacular to offer us. So this is the final aria that is sung collectively um, by the full chorus, as well as um, initially by David. Life is long and wisdom slow. I thought I knew, what did I know? Joy arrives, joy goes. Likewise, truth. Life is long and wisdom slow. If I was a seed, then, oh, what was the soil in which I grew? What do I know? What is the heart? Where the soul? Once I knew, life is long, wisdom slow. What is the heart? Where the soul? Am I the many or the few? How will I know? Oh, Lord. God, oh, what did I mistake for you? How will I know? Life is long and wisdom slow.